pick up the thread that leads back to the places of Columbus's infancy and youth, we have to start in Thread Lane, a rather obvious pun that is nevertheless reality. Today, arriving from Five Lamps Lane, you can see a sliver of the Cathedral of San Lorenzo, a sliver that grows the further up the lane you go. The black and white stripes that are the symbol of medieval Genoa, which built its monuments by alternating the white Apuan marble with a dark stone quarried in her own hills. And then, with the lions to the left of the steps, here we are at last, the cathedral, known throughout the world as the backcloth to the opera Simon Bocanegra. Let's go back to Thread Lane, narrow, dark, the roofs almost touch, and only let through a sliver of sky. This harks back to a past of invasions, where the inhabitants had to be able to jump from roof to roof. In these buildings in Columbus's times, there were booksellers and dealers in nautical charts and navigational instruments. Today we are offered incunables, whose covers read incureofili, or in Thread Lane in Latin. In the 13th century, the miniaturist Varizio had his workshop here. At the end of the 14th century, Chronicon was sold here, a book by the great writer Jacopo da Varagine, then known throughout Europe for the Legenda Sanctorum, better known as Legenda Aurea and who was also bishop of the city that was then known as Superba. But why are we letting the thread we picked up in Thread Lane be torn from our hands? Perhaps because of the north wind. Let's sweep over Genoa and western Liguria from above and from the Riviera move inland to Mocconesi. At the end of the 14th century, Columbus's forebears, his great-grandfather Antonio, and his grandfather Giovanni lived right here at Mocconesi in Volfantana Buona, where it may be that the family originally came after leaving the Piacenza region, coming up back what was then called Via del Pane, or Bread Road. The villages of Fontana Buona were already in existence. Sheep farming played an important role in their economy. They used the higher grazing lands and produced wool, which was then spun and woven in the villages. But the land was miserly, a cat perhaps, a little pile of wood, a vine or two, a patch of garden to hoe, images associated today with a humble, if not poor, countryside were the signs of an almost privileged lifestyle. In the first decade of the 15th century, Giovanni Columbus, Christopher's grandfather, moved to Quinto, where in 1418, according to explicit documentary evidence, Domenico, father of the navigator, was born. We don't know why the Columbus family moved from Mocconesi to Quinto. Perhaps they were seeking social advancement or hoped to find a milder climate for raising a more precious and profitable crop. Certainly not on account of the sea trade, as there was certainly no arbor in Quinto in those years. Whatever their reasons, the fortunes of the Columbuses and of the places associated with them exemplifies, in a way, the transition from a rural to an urban petite bourgeois civilization. This process was later to bring Christopher's father, Domenico, to Genoa. Here he continued to work wool, like his forebears, but also dedicated himself to trade and took part in the local politics of Campo Fregoso, or Fregoso. And thanks to this, he became custodian of the Porta del Olivella. Domenico's first house in Genoa, where almost certainly the future admiral was born, was on the outskirts just inside the walls, more or less where Via Bartolomeo Bosco is near today's Palazzo della Giustizia at Pamatone. 
Domenico Columbus led the modest life of a new immigrant, but improved his lot by marrying Susanna Fontana Rossa, whose family owned small properties at Ginestrato in Val Bisagno, an extensively cultivated district then, but densely populated today. Columbus was almost certainly baptized in the church of Santo Stefano in 1451. In those times, the churches were like little islands in a city where struggles between factions, then called Rasse, were so hard and violent that Antonio di Faye, cronista di Ludi, wrote, I no longer want to write of Genoa's mutations. There are so many, and I doubt I could find sufficient paper. Churches as islands, we were saying, in a whirlpool of tempestuous adventures. As a boy, and perhaps from his father, Columbus learned how the city managed to survive, if not unharmed, at least without suffering irreparable damage. The governorship of Jean Le Maigre, Marshal of France, also called Bossicol, and the dogates of the potent Fregosa family, with an interval under the rule of the Visconti, supported by the Adorno. As a young boy, Columbus often heard speak of the pride of the great families and when how Guillermo Embriaco, the hammerhead, wanted to build a tower taller than all the others in the heart of the city as an indelible monument to himself and his deeds. Columbus knew about the sublime near madness that Embriaco showed when on landing on the beaches of the Holy Land, he broke up all his ships to make siege machines for the conquest of Jerusalem. And he also knew of the sublime near madness of the Vivaldi brothers, the courageous Ulysses characters who went in search of lands on the other side of the Mar Tenebroso, beyond Hercules' columns. The stubbornness and the obstinate determination of Hammerhead and the Vivaldi were later to be seen in the navigator, the very Christopher Columbus, who as a young boy stopped in the church of San Donato to admire the vessel carved on a column to testify to a desire to go beyond ever present in the minds of the Genoese in their centuries. In another church, San Giovanni Battista del Paverano, the Pavian or Pavier of the French commentator Jean Dautin, the young Columbus probably contemplated both the stupendous nativity was he thinking of this when he later baptized the first settlement on the island of Hispaniola, La Natividad, and the heraldic griffin, complete with its noble crown, symbol of strength and pride? Perhaps it was in the old Pavian, today head office of the charity Istituto Don Orione, that the boy Columbus, with his brother Bartolomeo, learned the rudiments he then developed in the workshops of the Genoese cartographers and booksellers. Today, Genoa can boast perhaps the most extraordinary old city in Europe. In Columbus's times, the city was animated by the greed of its merchants, its artisans, those active in the various trades, pitch lane, flask makers lane, lead lane, iron square, bait lane, flask makers lane, oil lane, recall the activities of those who lived in them. Silk workers lived in Dye Street, in Campetta, the goldsmiths and craftsmen using coral from the waters of Portofino or Corsica and Tunisia. At the Molo worked the Macchiarolli, tanners, and in the same area a certain press square still exists, witnessing the presence of printers in that period. Some of the first to open in Italy after Gutenberg made his invention. And it is not by chance that one of the very first books he printed was the Catholicon by the Genoese Giovanni Balbi. A 
under the porticos of Sotoripa that were then adjacent to the docks, worked shipwrights, caulkers, lantern makers, anchor makers, sail makers, oar makers, nail makers. In Herb Square, the vegetables of the Val Bisagno were sold. In butchers of Sotsilia Street were, obviously, the butchers. Not far from Largo Zecca were the ovens of the bakers. As a young man, Columbus spent many hours in these places where life bustled incessantly, rich with memories and glory. He frequently visited the church of San Marco al Molo, built in the 1280s. Giovanni Mauro da Carignano was once its rector, the author of a world map with the famous image of the Sahara, used by the Ligurian merchant Antonio Malfante when he traveled there in 1447 to establish trading relationships with the Arabs living in a group of oases between the Algerian coast and the valley of the Niger. Christopher had heard of Giovanni Mauro and Malfante and Lanzarotto Malocello, who discovered the Canaries, and Antonio Danoli, one of the first navigators to reach Capo Verde. Just as he has heard of the fall of Constantinople and the horrors inflicted by the Turks. It was a main talking point under the porticos of Sotaripa, now, as then, a great meeting point for people from every walk of life. How could you recognize the Genoese in the midst of the crowd from their proud air, decisive, as well defined as the reliefs on the gate of San Giorgio in San Matteo, or the profiles of the towers of Porto Soprana? Christopher and his father Domenico went to live beneath these very towers in Vico di Rito di Ponticello when they left Vico dell'Olivella. In a drawing at the end of the 9th century, take note of the grey background, in a print of half a century ago, and in two much more recent images, we can see what is traditionally considered the second Genoese house of the Columbus family. Who knows, perhaps Christopher learnt his pride, sometimes at the limit of his own exaggerated opinion of himself, looking at those towers built by his fellow citizens in 1155, when they enclosed the town within new city walls as a challenge to Barbarossa, to whom they had said brusquely, we are not bound to pay tribute. The towers of Porto Soprano were high, but not as high as the tower of Capo di Faro, today's Lanterna, of which Christopher's uncle, Antonio Columbus, was keeper for a period, passing his childhood and at least part of his youth with his father and uncles, custodians of opposite points of the city, may have been one of the reasons that pushed the future navigator towards open spaces not bound by walls. As a boy, Columbus loved to travel and find new experiences. He was without doubt fond of Genoa, but the foreigners of Sotoripa and Piazza Banchi taught him to see himself as a citizen of the world. Perhaps he wasn't displeased when his father Domenico was forced to move to Savona because of the decline in the fortunes of the Fregoso family in Genoa. Columbus family first moved to the district of San Giuliano, not far from the present cathedral, and the home of Leon Pancaldo. A few years later they bought a house and holding in Valcada, in the countryside near Legino. The owner was Corrado da Cuneo, father of Michele, who later accompanied the navigator on his second transatlantic voyage. Columbus left for several of his first voyages in the Mediterranean from Savona, or perhaps Norley. At Norley, 
a city built of stone and red brick, proud in the Middle Ages of its independence and its 72 towers, only five remain today, Columbus probably met other cartographers. An act of the first years of the 15th century shows that the Republic of Genoa made subsidiaries to the cartographer Agostino from Noli. It is almost certain that Columbus stayed in the Byzantine church of San Paragorio in the city of stone and red brick. Columbus set sail for his first expeditions, perhaps from Savona, perhaps from Genoa, or even Noli. One of these voyages took him to Chio, where a Genoese company, or Mahona, traded in rubber. Another led him to Madeira, on behalf of the Didi Negros, to purchase a cargo of sugar as is demonstrated by the Acereto document, so named after its discoverer. Yet another took him to Portugal, to Lisbon. There are those who insist he arrived after a shipwreck on the rocks of Sagres. And then there were the years of the long wait, not only at Lisbon, but at Cordoba, Sevilla and elsewhere, before the plan for the great voyage became reality. Some say it was an enterprise undertaken by Christopher Columbus, mainly out of greed for riches and honors that could be exchanged for gold. Nothing could be less true. Columbus had learned at an early age to admire the houses that Nietzsche later described as built for future centuries not for the moment. Columbus had suffered the absurd contrast between the slivers of sky seen from the lanes of Genoa and the breadth of the horizons offered elsewhere under the same sky and on the same sea. He had also tasted the air that led Nietzsche to pardon Ligurians for their insatiable egoism, their unbound desire for possession and prey, holding them not to be manifestations of shabby venality, but rather the expression of an obstinate will to resist daily wear and tear. A will to last, to survive, that the great navigator documented so many times in his request for the privileges owed him for his discovery. It was in those years of his infancy, adolescence and youth, in these very places we have visited, that Christopher Columbus assimilated those constants of the Ligurian spirit that, over and above his place of birth, make him truly Genoese. But here the thread of our discourse is interrupted. To take it up again, perhaps we would do best to start again from Thread Lane.